Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the WorkWell podcast. Today in the show, I'm delighted to welcome Keith Barry. As the world's leading TV hypnotist, mentalist, and brain hacker, Keith Barry has been blazing a trail across the globe for many years. His mind-blowing skills have been showcased in over 40 international television shows. Keith also worked as chief mentalist and hypnotist consultant for the blockbuster movies Now You See Me 1 and 2, and soon to be number 3. He has written, produced, and performed many of his own stage shows over the last 15 years, and has sold out venues across the globe. Keith's TED Talk is in the top 25 TED Talks of all time, currently boasting over 25 million views. This episode is brought to you with thanks to The Fruit People. The Fruit People are leading the way in workplace nutrition, both in office and remotely. Check out thefruitpeople.ie for more. Thanks to The Fruit People, we have a delicious fresh fruit and healthy snack pack to give away to one lucky listener to this episode. To find out how to enter, go to workwellpodcast.com, find the link to this episode with Keith, and you'll find the competition details at the bottom of the article. Now sit back and enjoy my conversation with Keith Barry. So Keith, hello and welcome to the Work Well podcast. Hey, how are you? Really good, really good, thanks. How are you getting on? Yeah, good, thanks. I am mad busy with work, busy with family, and then uh, obviously this time of year, getting the garden ready to plant the vegetables. So uh, <laughs> hence I'm in, the, I'm in the veggie clothes while we're doing this talk. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, hands full there, uh, clearly. And yeah. Take, take us back a little bit. Um, take us back to March 10th, 2020. So you were, you were on stage at the Olympia. It was a full house. Mm. The show went really well. And the next day, I think every, everything changed. It's kind of strange looking back because as I look back on it, and I haven't really spoken about this before, like this particular, I, I suppose, statement I've got to make is that gig that I did in the Olympia, that specific gig on March 10th was one of the best gigs I've certainly done in a couple of years. Um, so it's strange to look back on it from that perspective that I went from such a high to such a low, I suppose, pretty much overnight. Like I remember, so, so for example, on March 10th, uh, the end of my show, Insanity, every single night, I would end the show with a rave, like a full-on rave. So the whole audience would be raving. And it was a reveal to a magic trick. So it wasn't a rave for the sake of a rave, but the energy that that creates is phenomenal. Uh, but also my parents were there, like my uncle and auntie were there, my wife was there. And I, I basically coerced slash forced all of them to come out on stage for the rave. So, all, so it was an amazing moment. And then, yeah, the next day, like MCD called to say, obviously, look, the rest of the tour had been canceled. Now, look, I, I was lucky that the rest of the tour for me was actually only two dates. Mm -hmm wasn't too bad um but then yeah it was kind of like you know what do you do so you know like everybody i just kind of thought oh i'll, I'll take a bit of a holiday i suppose for a couple of weeks and see how this pans out and then uh, i suppose here we are all this time later you know i know yeah some some change all right so what, what did you do how did you you pivot then um was it straight online or or, or what what were the next few weeks like yeah, it didn't take too long. So the next kind of, I suppose, six weeks, uh, you know, I was just pretty much a bit lost, like a lot of people even now still are maybe. And, you know, I was just trying to figure out what to do, whether even what I was doing could be pivoted and put online. Um, so like for that six weeks, I suppose I was kind of just empty, if you like, and probably a bit cranky to be around even, you know, and as I said, just loss of purpose and just not knowing what to do. But then I, I kind of got myself together after that six weeks and then made the, the decision to at least research the possibility of going online. So I did that over the course of like 10 days. And then I went into what I call super activation mode. So super activation mode for me is one gear forward, um, 18 hours a day work. Now, obviously, may, always making enough time for exercise and family within that 18 hours. Okay, so for me, exercise I consider part of my job so that's very different than a lot of people because I've got to exercise to be fit to be on stage to do the escapology part of what I do so that comes within the bubble of my job and but then I always make enough time for my family but with that being said super activation mode means everything else goes away so 
the hobbies are gone. Um, Netflix is gone. Like, everything is gone until I need to do what needs to be done. And at that moment in time, it was pivot online. So, you know, I needed to figure out just the technical aspect of it even. So, you know, I had a, a cabin in my back garden, which I'm sitting in now talking to you. Um, and I'd actually gotten this built right before COVID hit. So I got lucky from that perspective, being honest with you, because this was just supposed to be a kind of an escape away from my office in my house where I could be creative and come up with my shows and, you know, write books and just, you know, be that creative space. Um, but very quickly, I had to figure out how to turn this into a virtual studio if I needed to go online. So that's what we did. I mean, we started with the basics, being honest, just how can I put Wi-Fi in here that's strong enough to take a thousand devices on Zoom? So that was the first port of call. And, you know, I chased down the, the MD of Imagine and Vodafone and was like, listen, I need the highest upload and download speeds imaginable and I need two backup systems hardwired. So we started there. And then my um, technical director who directs all of my online shows, Joe Clear. So Joe has worked with me for like 15 years now um, in my live gigs. And I just said to him, figure it out quickly. We got to go online. So he's a fantastic guy and he did. So the, the backdrop that you're looking at here for any of your listeners that are just listening, like I, I had a library back here, which was, wasn't for shows, it was an actual real library. <laughs> But we took that out because I knew everybody would have a library in the back. <laughs> and, uh, and we put shelving in, as you can see. So we put props there. We also put um, a green screen in. We weren't sure if we would ever use the green screen, but we put the green screen in anyway. Um, and then up lights here. There's a full lighting rig behind the computer there uh, in the ceiling. And then I've got one, two, three, four, five screens in here, like big screens. So I can see gallery views and we can, we also... We don't just use the platforms. In other words, we don't just use Microsoft Teams or Zoom or WebEx. We use software systems to make it look way better to the human eye. So we know Microsoft Teams and Zoom fatigue actually exists. Mm -hmm. so look, we had to do all of that. And then I had to get word out that I was gone online. Um, so that took, again, super activation, but I talk about it all the time. And people sometimes don't realize, you know, if you do it, you're going to win. So, and I know that. So for me, that required over the summer, sending out 5,000 emails. And I mean 5,000 to the button because I made a conscious decision that that's how many emails needed to be sent out. Um, and that was just me and my executive assistant, Mairead, um, who uh, being honest is also my wife. So uh, <laughs> just the two of us uh, banging out 5,000 emails. So that took the whole summer. So instead of painting the fence and cutting the grass. That's what we did. And luckily then, you know, it paid off because at the end of last year, it, it just took off. And now uh, that's where I'm at. I've got a full-time a full -time online business. Fantastic, yeah. And I, I've had an insight into, I guess, some of the, the live and virtual sessions you've been delivering for organizations. I guess one, thanks to social media, but two, uh, also through feedback from members of, of the WorkWell community. And yeah. And the impression that I think everybody is getting is just an, it's an incredibly professional production and delivery. I mean, where people are laughing and joking about people turning up to meetings or workshops casually dressed in the shorts. But I mean, you're there, you're, you're fully suited and booted. You're going on stage effectively. For yeah, I sessions. I probably should be suited and booted for your podcast. Right? <laughs> Podcast is supposed to be audio only, but look, I, I, I jest because mm -hmm. look, this morning I was out in the garden, as I said, and then I just ran in here. Uh, but yeah, listen, I say to people all the time, like I give actually workshops now on how to present yourself correctly on Zoom and on the platforms, uh, more in the kind of sales scenario. So in other words, how to use neuro-linguistic programming to move a person from A to B and how to read somebody's body language. Um, you know, obviously without them saying a single word and how to think and know what they're thinking without them talking. That comes down to micro expressions and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, for me, you know, when I decided to pivot online, it had to be the most professional out, uh, you know, output that we could have. So we film in 4K HD, we stream it out like that. We've got like multiple camera shots. Um, and then also, yeah, I'm suited and booted all the time. Like last night, uh, I was suited and booted until 3 a.m. I was pitching um, some projects over to the networks in the U.S., mm -hmm. some of the big networks in the U.S. Um, so here, here's, here's a, a first for you, okay? Uh, so I haven't spoken about this yet. Um, last year, so this time last year, pretty much, I, when I was in the Olympia Theater, when I, when I flipped that couple of weeks later online, I decided I wanted to get back on the Ellen DeGeneres. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a long story, so I won't get into it. But ultimately, 
to vision that and action upon it and make it happen, I started talking about it in my keynotes as if it was going to happen. So I said in every keynote that I started in, I'm going to be on Ellen DeGeneres later this year. Here's how I will do it. I'm going on super activation mode and I won't take no for an answer. And they were all laughing and giggling like in these keynotes that I was giving because they just thought it was a big, big crackpot of an idea. Now, I've been on Ellen DeGeneres a bunch of times previously, but I hadn't been on in 13 years. So you mm -hmm. have to understand. I didn't have any contact within the Ellen organization. So I was starting from scratch mm -hmm. the same way, you know, Brian Crook would need to go right now to Ellen to get on Ellen. Same process. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, that happened in October last year. Um, and that's what super activation mode is. But to backtrack for a second, like that's when I knew I had to have the highest professional quality studio, like to the extent that I'm just going to be straight with you. We deal with all the agencies in Dublin around the world, actually, like the UK and the US, and they're all fantastic and they're all doing amazing things. But a lot of them are actually ringing us now looking for advice on how to produce an online show slash presentation, because again, um, we took the time to learn the system, learn the kinks, and then uh, presented it as best as we possibly can. And I've learned a lot as well, you know. I, I had that on the list actually to ask you. I wanted to ask you about that Ellen appearance because I think I did. I heard you speak about that previously. That you know, effectively, you had that on your your vision board. That was something you aimed for. Like you, you made that happen yourself. Yeah, yeah like I have to tick it off because here's the gas thing. <laughs> I looked at my goals last night and I've achieved, I've got one to 10, five, four. So I've got 19 short-term, medium-term, long-term and zany goals. And out of the 19, I can't see it from here, but I know I looked last night, I've probably got about 11 of them done. So I need to wipe them off now and replace them with something else. But like I, you know, now those all 18 should technically be done by now. But see, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, I always set enough targets. I don't overdo it, but I set mm -hmm. enough targets that if in a year's time I've hit over 50% of those targets, that's a massive success because I set really, really high targets for myself. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my new targets <laughs> in the middle of this, um, you know, is years ago I set a target. So it was when I was 23 when I, uh, when I decided to become a full-time entertainer. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, I was still in a full-time day job uh, and I decided, look, if I didn't get to be a full-time entertainer by the time I was 30, then I would give up the dream. And I would have given it up. I know I would have given it up. But luckily, I turned professional when I was 23. So I was seven years ahead of that target. Mm -hmm. And then from then, it was, it was always debt-free by 60. That was kind of my motto in my head. But I, then I thought to myself, like just in the middle of this whole crazy world that we're in, why am I waiting till I'm 60? So now my new thing is debt-free by 50. You know, so I've got six years to achieve that now. So just get all the debts gone. Um, people might be surprised to hear that, that I still have debts, but like, mm -hmm. like a lot of people, I still have debts. I still have mortgages. So yeah. it's uh, debt free by 50. Um, but yeah, the Ellen thing really helped with the U S branding because now I've, I've got a lot of work in the U S. So like I, I did a gig just a couple of weeks ago for EO Nashville. Um, uh, and then I had a gig like the night before that in New York. Um, so yeah, it really helped, you know? Brilliant. Talk to me about the, the, the vision, the vision board stuff again. Um, for for the for the lay person, I suppose for, for everybody, how do you determine whether your zany goal is you know too ridiculous, say, to be achieved? How do you stretch yourself, push yourself, but at the same time have that element of of realism in there? Um, with the zany goals, there's no realism. Right. You allow yourself, you allow yourself to go as bonkers and as crazy as possible. I think we're too self limiting, especially mm -hmm. in the times that we're in. So we have to eliminate those self limiting beliefs. If I told you, for example, that I was going to hang upside down outside the RT building with uh, a straitjacket around me, 150 foot in the air with my head wrapped in cling film so I couldn't see or breathe, you'd say, well, that sounds impossible. Well, yeah. And, and when I come up with these stunts, I've no idea how I'm going to do them. See, that's what people don't understand about the magical mm -hmm. thinking of a magician. When we come up with things, we train ourselves to not limit ourselves. We don't know how we're going to do all these things. People wonder the process. The process is I come up with the idea first and then I backtrack mm -hmm. down to a, a reasonable method. So for me, like one of my zany goals and dreams, and I keep saying this so I know it's going to happen. And, and I feel a bit silly saying it because I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm actually going to have to do this someday now. Uh, so it's climbing Kilimanjaro in my underpants with the Iceman, Wim Hof. <laughs> <laughs> so that sounds like crazy probably to a lot of your listeners. 
and it is crazy and it's supposed to be crazy but your crazy goals and dreams should be aspirational mm -hmm. um, so i talk about my goals as targets so i don't have i don't have goals written up on my vision board there i've got targets see goals very often can become just an aspirational thing that you're looking towards whereas a target it has a, a specific measurable distance that like if you think of it better like an arrow uh, reaching a, a target it's got a a measure distance that that arrow needs to go. Whereas a goal sometimes, even if you put a timeline on it, can sometimes in your head just become, as I said, aspirational. So I see everything as targets and I write them down as targets and I give myself that measurable uh, distance to go, that measurable time to go. And then obviously, you know, figure out the actions required to move towards those targets. So when you go back to the vision board, I've got a vision board, you know, some people rip out magazines and stuff, but then they just sit there and they kind of practice the law of attraction. And they hope that that's going to happen. Listen, yeah. law of attraction is great, but like you're not going to sit in your house and dream up that a Lamborghini is going to land outside it. And that was, you know, I suppose popularized uh, way back when with the secret, the book, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think people missed uh, the point, or I'd have to look back on it whether they made the point or not. That you have to take massive action. Um, so if you look at the high performers in business, for example, the Bransons, the Musks. Like Elon Musk is a good example. Like mm -hmm. I do believe he's a bit of a kind of a trap genius. He's got a very strange way of thinking, an interesting way of thinking. But like in all of his interviews, they say to him, you know, what's you give us a couple of insights to the secret to your success? And he goes, Yeah, well, you know, working 80 to 120 hours a week when the when the competition is working 40. Mm -hmm. And within three months, you'll achieve what they would have achieved in a year. And there's a lot to be said for that. Now, of course, people listening might say, well, don't you want to find balance in life? <laughs> I'm like, balance is boring for me. I, like I've made a very conscious decision that, you know, potentially I could be knocking three years off my lifespan by the type of lifestyle that I live. I'm very happy to do that because I'm achieving all these crazy, interesting things that I'm achieving. I'm living what I consider a peak performance lifestyle, not meaning that I'm always at peak performance. I'm not, I fail a lot. So I don't want to put myself up on any kind of pedestal. Mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is I program myself daily to achieve all of these different things that I want to achieve. I put in massive hours, but the most important thing is I always am conscious of spending enough time with my family. Mm -hmm. and I, that's the balance that a lot of people miss. Balance for me is just being very aware of not just spending time with my family or quality time, but actually wanting to spend mm -hmm. that quality time with my family. And if you look at a lot of you know high performers in business, a lot of them are divorced, a lot of them are lonely. Um, a lot of people talk about how wonderful Steve Jobs was, but if you look at his biography or his, uh, you know, or his history, you know, I don't necessarily know that he was a very happy person when he mm -hmm. passed, you know, because he didn't, to my knowledge, spend that time with his family. And he certainly uh, didn't appear to be the most endearing or empathetic human being that you would come across. Um, and for me, I at least aspire to be all of that, uh, not him, like empathetic and yeah. aspirational. Uh, and as I said, I fail a lot, but at least if you have that mindset, um, then it'll serve you well. I love that. Yeah. I love that, that, that mindset idea. Um, and the balance is an interesting point you raise. I was, again, I wanted to ask you about the, the super activation mode. Is that, does that come in peaks and troughs? Do you like, are you in that for three months and then maybe you're, you pull back for a month before you go again, or how, how does that work? Yeah, no, you hit it pretty much bang on. It's kind of three months at a time. Right. It's not sustainable in the long term. Mm -hmm. Like I, as a, an executive coach and, and a, a person who's worked with athletes like uh, Scott Evans or Olympic badminton player, Rory Best, Keith Earls, um, you know, a lot of golfers as well. Ultimately, like you should be getting seven hours sleep. That's the science, right? Mm -hmm. So the science is it's not eight hours. It's not nine hours. It's not six hours. The average human being should be getting a solid seven hours unbroken sleep, especially athletes. Um, so when you're on super activation mode, you're kind of only getting five or six hours sleep a night. Um, so that's not sustainable in the wrong, long run. You will burn out. Now for me, I've just got the type of DNA that I can go a long time on little sleep um, without it being too detrimental to me. So a long time for me is three months. I recommend that people don't do longer than three months. Uh, and then you take a break. And then I try not to go again, but life kind of throws these curveballs at me where I'm like, okay, I got to go again. And uh, so that happened, certainly last year that happened, but it's kind of happening this year as well. Like I've got a lot of projects on and to make the time to do the amount of things that I like to do, then ultimately you got to put in the hours. It's like Will Smith. Will, see, I, I believe that one sentence can change your life forever if you start to really listen to people. So for example, with your podcast, I'm sure people listen to it and then they go back about their business and they might think, 
slightly about something somebody has said, maybe Dermot Wheel, like you mentioned, or, or myself, whatever. But actually, when we listen to podcasts, when we read books, we should look at them and listen to them with an open mind to changing the course of our life forever with one sentence, one word even. So for me, that happened years ago because I, I always attacked uh, knowledge from that perspective of you know, self-development, learning, and being willing to change my habits and my plan and my destination. So ultimately, years ago, uh, Will Smith, uh, he was just a rapper at the time. So I'm going back about 20 years or more. The and Fresh Prince. Yeah, yeah, back to the Fresh Prince. Mm -hmm. Probably even before that. And uh, and he was a rapper. And they basically, he was in this interview and they said to him, look, what's the secret to your success? And he said, oh, it's quite simple. When all the rappers are in bed, I'm up rehearsing my rapping. And that's it. And, and that resonated with me. So even to this day, I say to myself, all right, why am I putting in this late hours? Because every every night I'm up to like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Uh, and, and then I say to myself, well, all the other magicians are in bed. All the other executive coaches, they're all in bed. I'm up absorbing knowledge, writing knowledge. I'm up writing new keynotes. And then, you know, I might pop onto Instagram for a second to see who else is up. And, and then I look at the rock, Dwayne Johnson. Regardless of what your opinion is on the man, like he's, he's a very positive human being. He's always online, but he gets up at 3 a.m. and does a workout and then he goes straight to set, <laughs> right? So, you know, you look at him and, and again, he's a massively successful individual. So um, for me, the key is always also being infinitely curious, as I say it, and then having a lot of fun. Like I have a huge amount of fun and that's the part that people miss. I'm not here hating coming into my cabin. I'm not here hating talking to you or hating being, I'm loving every moment of it all. Now, sometimes it can be hard work. So for example, when I flipped on mine initially, I was worried about the internet dropping out. I was worried about my own material not working. I was worried about, uh, was Joe up to scratch on, you know, switching cameras and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, you have those moments. So at the start of a new project, there's all that anxiety and things that come with it. Uh, but now I'm actually loving it. Uh, but I love getting back to performing live as well. So this won't replace that. Yeah. And I can't wait to get back to performing live. But there's nothing that I do that I find I hate doing. You know what I mean? Look, yeah, I totally get it. And uh, fully, as a self-employed person as well, fully appreciate the, the hard work and, and working when people aren't, aren't working and, and getting that advantage. Well, what about the argument then you, you, we often hear of working smarter and not harder? Maybe somebody like Cal Newport who would talk about you know, get your periods of deep work, but then also your periods of is it exercise, is it relaxation, is it family time, is it downtime effectively, where those periods of downtime will actually allow your deep work periods to be that bit more creative, that bit more innovative, and a bit more productive. Yeah, look, I agree with him on a, on a certain extent, but when you're on super activation mode, no. I mean, <laughs> you gotta get stuff done. So, like, for example, in the middle of a pandemic, I created, this is a new business. This is not a business model that existed for me. So if I just put in like a certain amount of dedicated time, let's just call it like, you know, take, we'll just say take the weekends off. So that's two days off. And then if I worked, maybe I upped it a little bit and I worked 10 hours a day instead of what I talk about, which is working, you know, minimum 16, but you know, for me, it's 18 hours a day. Well, you know, you could do that. But I would not be sitting here talking to you having had the December that I had, which is working five to seven gigs a day in December. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't have happened. So um, I do believe in the fact that you have to have downtime and refresh and reboot and all that kind of stuff. So on a regular basis, outside of my super activation mode, I do all of this thing. So that's why I talk about it being infinitely curious. So for me, um, you know, the, the real downside to this whole pandemic that we're in is I can't get to do the things that I just enjoy doing that are really good for my mind. Mm -hmm. And I always think about this, like, you know, I've got a back garden. It's a small back garden. People need to realize that, right? I've got a small back garden, but it's a back garden nonetheless. So I feel like if I can't get out and do the things that I enjoy doing that are, as I put it, cheaper than therapy. So I've never had to go to therapy, but like, that's because I put tools and techniques in place to alleviate any stress that I might have. But I do feel like, oh my God, what would it be like to be just living in a city center right now in an apartment? Mm -hmm. Like that has to be so difficult for people. Um, so what I miss is, and that's to go back to your point, what I do regularly for my own mind is like, I go fishing. So fishing is my passion. I say it's cheaper than therapy. So I go down on the Banks River or out to the sea and I'll sit there for hours and just empty my brain. 
Um, similarly, though, I'll bring my family foraging. So I'll bring the kids foraging during the summer. Uh, I bring them on foraging courses. I bring them swimming in the sea. Um, like I love adventure as well. Mm -hmm. So when I'm not doing that super active, so even when I'm doing the super activation mode, I always make enough time for my family. So that helps me de-stress anyway. And we're big gamers in our family. So that could just be as simple as sitting down, um, you know, and, and playing a board game for an hour. And that could be during a weekday, but that just means that it has to come out of my sleep. Um, so that's fine. I'll do that. Um, and then the weekends, of course, I'll spend more time with them. So, uh, but again, to loop back to it, you know, for me, if you're creating a new business, you got to go all in and then just spend that time with the family. And then you got to, you know, park your downtime, uh, for a couple of months until you get stuff done. And then you can come back up, breathe the fresh air and go again, uh, and reboot. Um, but yeah, on an ongoing basis, I do loads of things like every day. Uh, see, I consider this part of my work though. That's where people might, uh, I suppose, misunderstand me. So. Uh, for me, part of my work is doing my Wim Hof breathing every single day. Part of my work is a cold shower. So people might go, how's that part of work? Well, like you, like I'm self-employed. Mm -hmm. I'm the boss. I'm the business. So I've got to be the best possible version of myself every single day. So that means exercise, Wim Hof breathing, my flexibility band work because I'm covered in injuries of loads of injuries, uh, bad injuries at that. Um, so I've got to keep those at bay, cold showers to dump dopamine, serotonin and adrenaline into my system first thing in the morning. Um, so all of these things I do on a regular basis, in addition then to the super activity mode. So, so yeah, I mean, for me, again, I find balance boring. Uh, too many people go, oh, you have to have balance. Yeah, that's okay. If you want to have an average life, go, go for it. Work nine to five, you know, watch Netflix and, uh, uh, whatever you want to do, you know? Yeah, yeah, very good. Like the, the moderation argument as well. Do you want a, a moderate life? That's the that's the other uh, thing you hear as well. So totally get that. T tell us a little bit about the the live shows now and what 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 the uh, the audience can expect. Is you're making them as interactive as possible? Well, this is where it might be interesting for your listeners to to gain an insight into what I've learned. Actually, mm -hmm. so there's loads of platforms out there, and I've used nearly all of them at this stage um and they all have their pluses and minuses but it's really interesting to me that you know we'll just say a year ago most companies would not use zoom okay mm -hmm. because they were frightened of the security aspect of it but yeah. very quickly the majority of companies just so your listeners know and understand this the majority of companies and i'm talking about big tech firms they've all flipped and used zoom for their wellness seminars for um, you know, employee engagement, for presentations, keynotes, for people like me to perform. And here's why. A web the days of webinars are limited. I'll tell you that. Because a webinar is a person speaking to a camera and everybody else hidden in the background and maybe there's a chat function open, okay? Listen to me here, people. I'm telling you now, the days of webinars are gone. You know, your employees are sitting there. They've got the kids going on. They've got themselves on mute. You have no idea whether they're even listening to this thing. Uh, and then the odd little chat that comes in, it's terrible. Um, so for me, with my own performances, as best as I can, I encourage the, the end user, the client to use Zoom because I set it up as, as, so I host, we take all the problems away from the client. So we do everything for them. But ultimately uh, my Zoom account can take up to a thousand people with cameras on as a meeting and that's what you want you want to see your employees they need to see each other you want to create that collaborative experience um you know we project them up on the green screen here behind us they're big and larger than life you know that's far different than a webinar um and a lot of the other platforms i have found are really only set up for webinars you can do stuff on them. We do stuff on them. And when the client insists, hey, look, they're paying the bills. So I'll be like, okay, you want me to use WebEx? You want me to use Teams? You want me, to, whatever it is you want me to do, I'll use everything, mm -hmm. okay? And I won't knock any of the platforms, but they were all built for a specific purpose. They weren't built to bring a thousand cameras on all at the same time. And again, if you're hosting a webinar, my advice is pre-record everything and then just fire it out and let them watch it whenever they want. Because um, again, I, you know, that bit of engagement that comes from a chat box, like it's nonsense, really. You know, you're not really getting a conversation going from that. Um, 
So for me, again, uh, for my own performances, at least, uh, you know, that engagement factor comes from everybody having their cameras on. And then I've got macro effects, which are effects that happen and work with all 1000 people or devices simultaneously. And then I've got micro effects where I pull people up at random, uh, much like I would in a live performance in a theater and I interact with them. And then I suppose it's split down the middle for me. So 50% of my work right now online is pure entertainment. So companies rewarding their employees for staying at home and just thanking their employees for staying at home. And then 50% is employee motivation, engagement, sales tactics like NLP sales tactics, leadership keynotes. I've got a keynote on redefine the impossible, which goes back to, you know, your zany goals and dreams, mm -hmm. you know, never limit those. Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. We're always continuously improving as well. So I, I have this conversation with Joe all the time and he agrees with me. We got to keep improving. We've got to keep researching the tech. We got to see what else we can do that's new and better than everybody else out there. Um, so, so yeah, like, you know, I see a lot of speakers just sitting on a laptop, like we're on laptops right now talking because it's predominantly a podcast. And as we know, this is more of a, an audio medium rather than a, ver a visual medium, but ultimately like, you know, uh, you've got to have just the best quality output of everything, audio visuals, when you're doing these things on a professional basis. Uh, but I find even now we're a year into this, when I look at other performers, other speakers, they're sitting on their laptop in their kitchen. You know, again, yeah. you got to spec that up. You got to get past that quickly because companies are getting bored of that. You know. Yeah, love it. Love that approach. Um, you know, really professional. Uh, makes makes so much sense. And anything else you're working on at the moment, kind of in in lockdown, um, planning, scripting out live shows, any interesting projects you're working, any other kind of super activation tasks no. we can look forward to. Loads, but I sign NDAs all the time. <laughs> I can't talk about half the stuff that I work on. That's actually true. Um, yeah. but here's the thing. So I read a lot of old books here. I'll show you. Look, so I even have them here. Nothing to do with this, uh, with your podcast, but just, you know, there's lots of cool books out there. You got Jordan Peterson, you got Atomic Habits and all those, and they're all great. But I look at the old stuff. I find the juice in these. So like How to Own Your Mind by uh, Napoleon Hill. Oh, yeah. Napoleon Hill, Success Habits, amazing books, like really amazing and better, like in my opinion, better than the majority of books, uh, self-help style books that are out there at the moment. And I read as many of them as I can. Obviously, time-wise, I can't read everything. But um, but to get back to it, the reason I mentioned Napoleon Hill is I remember reading, I can't remember what book it was. Um, so it was either him or... Uh, he is the other, the famous book, isn't it? The, the other book, I can't think of the name of them myself. At the Personal Power is another book of his. Okay, yeah. Oh, there's another guy that I read a lot of. Just It's lost me at the moment. But it was either Napoleon Hill or this other guy. But ultimately, I think it was Napoleon Hill who said, do a lot of things and do them well, and that will serve you well in life. And that really resonated with me. And, and I am the type of character, I do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. so I love magic. I love mentalism. I love hypnotism. I now enjoy performing online. Uh, I love helping and serving other people with their mindset. Um but that means I have a lot going on at any one time. But I find that's great because one ball drops, I always have four other balls to keep me going. And if another ball drops, I have two balls. So I always have something going on. So to get back to it, look, um, in the middle of the pandemic, I ended up working on, now you see me three. So I'm working on oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So that actually, I envisaged that, right? Working on that. I'd heard that they were starting to work on it already. And I thought, Hmm, that's kind of interesting that I didn't get a call about that <laughs> involved in one and two. So I reached out and I, I kind of uh, hassled a few people in Lionsgate. <laughs> uh, I'm working on Now You See Me 3 at the moment. Fantastic. Um, and I randomly ended up working on a project called Citadel, um, which is for Amazon, I believe. Um, so Richard Madden, who's an amazing actor, people will know him from Game of Thrones. I ended up working with him on Citadel uh, with some, some kind of sleight of hand maneuvers for that. Um, then I am actively, so so this is what I was gonna say. Um, you know, last year I said it about Ellen. So now, right now I'm actively pitching a new TV project into the US. So I've all, already had a bunch of meetings with the networks over there virtually, of course. Um, but when I say it, it tends to happen. Yeah. Um, so my good instinct is by the end of this year, probably September time is going to be my guess that uh, I'll have a new US 
network television show that I'll be working on. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, and that took a year to get those meetings. Now that took a year just yeah. to get the meetings. Like, that's how hard it is to get a meeting with the networks in America. Um, you know, they don't respond to your emails, but I have my will and my ways, but it took a year. So, yeah. long. so I've pitched to them. So that's kind of a waiting game now. Um, and then hopefully I'd love to do some more TV here in Ireland, but of course we got to see the way the vaccine is rolled out, whether or not I can get a, a an audience and studio and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then a couple of other projects that I actually genuinely can't talk about, but yeah, they're all happening. There's, there's going to be a lot of news, uh, from my sphere, if you like, by September, uh, on other projects as well that, uh, as I said, I can't really talk about right now. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely love the approach. I mean, if it's, you know, talking about it, socializing and getting it out there and then actually making it happen coupled with, it seems like almost Gary Vaynerchuk style or Gary V style hustle. To, to get those meetings yeah, to... It's kind of interesting when you mentioned Gary V. Like, I look at Gary V, and uh, I've never met him. I'd love to interview him myself because mm -hmm. I've got a new YouTube series. So I'd love people... To I, I, I've met him. I can introduce you. Oh, yeah, great. Right, <laughs> well done. I, I, have you interviewed him for your podcast yet? I haven't, no. I bumped into him coming out of the loo at the Dublin Tech Summit. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> We're great buddies. Yeah, but, but, but here's the thing about Gary, right? Uh, he's very opinionated, which I kind of like. I, I read Crush It, by the way. I think oh, yeah. I read book. it, yeah. But I read it like whatever it was 15 years ago when he was yeah. just starting out. Um, but Gary, as I look at him, I say this to his face. So I'm not saying it like he doesn't look healthy to me. Like Gary needs to peel it back a bit. You know, he needs to yeah. go out and get vitamin D on his face. <laughs> you know, so I think he's on super activation mode all, all the, the time. And he, he actually he is a full time personal trainer who, who lives with him and travels with him. Yeah, see, that's fantastic. If you, if you can afford it, you have yeah. a dietitian. Like, I looked at that documentary. I'm like, I'm going on a tangent here, but I looked at a documentary. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it, which was about veganism on, on YouTube, or sorry, on Netflix. Yeah. And loads of people immediately became vegan because of it. Like, it was a big thing. Yeah, the, the game changers. Yeah, the game changers. So, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger was yeah. there saying that he's now a vegan. But then you look at the business behind it. Arnie owns all the, yeah. the vegan burger products. Um, <laughs> and then if you look into the vegan burger products, which I did, they're all full of like crappy preservatives and all that kind of stuff. So you're not eating vegetables, you're eating just crap. Like if you're going to eat, be a vegan, be a vegan. Like I have nothing against veganism. I'm like, I know. So Woody Harrelson, who's now a good friend, Woody's a strict vegan, but he does it properly. He eats vegetables. He eats raw vegetables all the time, you know? So when I look into it, I look at like that kind of stuff with like a, a skeptical eye. Um, and like Arnie, who won all those Mr. Universe and Mr. Olympias, he wasn't eating just vegetables back then. No. I can tell you that much. Uh, but I don't know. I, I have no idea what my point was there. I think. <laughs> Something to do with Gary V. Oh, Gary V. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so I, I don't know what it is, but like ultimately, just loop back to Gary V again. You know, I just think for me, Gary V is on the super activation mode all the time, and I'm not. So that I have to be clear yeah. about that. Uh, I put in I put in long hours and yeah. long hustle. Um, uh, but I love it, and and I th yeah, he loves it as well. Um, but you just have to be mindful of the fact that mm -hmm. you don't completely run yourself into the ground. Like David Copperfield is a good example. So Copperfield, uh, I don't know about now, but certainly for a number of years, mm -hmm. ended up in hospital a couple of times a year because he would do two shows a night, like 350 nights in the year or something. Yeah. And he'd burn out multiple times a year. Um, and that's going to happen to you if, if you don't put other processes in place, which are the processes that I mentioned, like my Wim Hof, my exercise, um, and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Most, oh, yeah. No, my, my point was about the game changers. It came back to me. So when I watched the game changers, they were talking about these American NFL footballers who turned vegan, right? Yeah. But then they showed them, right? And they've all got cooks, chefs. Oh, yeah. Got, so, so all these meals are being delivered to them all the time. So they don't have to put any thought into the preparation of their own food. So that's fine if you, uh, if you have people, if you've got the the affordability to have a team around you to, to prepare all that stuff and do all that stuff. So the same with Gary V. I'm sure he's getting his meals delivered to him. Uh, Ryan Serhant, he talks about it as well, you know, that he, he just gets meals delivered all the time. That's grand. But like, mm. I'm still like a normal Irish man. And I go out and I cook my own dinner and I cook my own food. Like I cook on the barbecue all year round. I probably do it five days a week. Um, and that takes a bit of your time, you know? Yeah, um, yeah so... That's my ramble on. Brilliant, Gary. no, brilliant, yeah. I'd love to get Gary Vee for my own YouTube series, by the way. It just, just says, while we're here, this is important. I'd love your listeners to know. I've got a new YouTube series that I'm oh, starting. Yeah. Um, 
and it's just started. So content is just starting to go up, but I've got amazing interviews um, with like Rory Best, Victoria Smurfett, Keith Earls, Sean McGuire, who's a big Hollywood actor, um, Ed Solomon, who wrote Bill and Ted, and now you see me, he's a screenwriter. And, oh, yeah. Um, and and the, the information, and Suzanne Jackson, the influencer, so I've, uh, Ellen Keane, the Paralympian. Um, so I've got some amazing interviews with these people where information is revealed that otherwise would not be revealed because of what I do. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So if people want to check out my YouTube channel, it's just... Uh, Keith Barry, you'll find me up on YouTube. And class, we, we, we'll, we'll include a link to that in the in the show notes. Yeah, Great. class. Look, look forward to that. I, I do. I know. I ask. I ask every guest about you know, how do they look after their own well being. But I think you've, you've probably kind of answered that. You've got exercise is important. It's it's part of your routine. The band work you mentioned, the breathing, and I say nutrition is is a big deal as well. Cooking your own food. You've kind of you've kind of touched on that as well. Yeah, I'm an unrepentant carnivore. So I've, I've looked into. Uh, <laughs> I've looked into the the benefits of being a vegan. I know there is benefits, um, but but I'm very happy to still uh, be on a carnivore diet. So for me though, yeah, I keep the carbs pretty low Monday to Friday. I eat healthy, so I eat lots of vegetables as well. Um, you know, and, and I think it's important to do that. And then I relax the weekends. So like tonight, like I'm actually just trying to organize having a couple of drinks with like my dad and a couple of friends. Um, virtually, of course, the new world that we're all in. Um, and, and then, you know, just putting those tools in, in, in place. I suppose the only thing that I didn't mention is that I, I creatively visualize all the time. So that's like basically uh, a cousin, if you like, to self-hypnosis. So I literally sit in a chair that's over there and uh, I've got a blindfold and headphones and I put the hood up and I zip up my jacket and I put a rug over me so... Our, uh, my wife roars laughing when she comes in and she finds me like in, a, in an altered state of mind <laughs> in the corner of the room. But then I visualize everything that I want in life uh, and that changes the neurology of the brain. You know, you're not the same person that you were yesterday. Today, you're creating new neural pathways every moment of every day. And people don't put thought into that. They don't put thought into the fact that the WhatsApp groups that they are, where all that crap is being sent into their brain, your subconscious mind can't unsee that. And unless you train your subconscious mind to deal with that, that will be detrimental to your mental health in the long run. So I say to people, focus on what you're focusing on. In other words, pay attention to what you're looking at and what you're absorbing. I remember I was at um, a hurling match a couple of years ago and a client of mine had invited me to this hurling match. And uh, he went, oh, look at this, Keith, look at this. And he put his phone right up in front of me. And like, it was just like disgusting the image that he showed me. I'm not going to even mention what, it, I'm not even going to hint as to what it was, but it was just pure disgust. And I said, delete that, um, not just that message, but delete yourself out of that WhatsApp group right now. I said, or otherwise we're not working together anymore. I mean, mm. you're stupid. And, and people don't realize that all this stuff, this noise on Twitter that yeah. they go through, this, uh, it's really bad for their mindset. So I always say to people, guard your mind wisely at all times. You know, guard your mind wisely at all times. I really, like, I really live like that. So I just surround myself by useful information. Now I, I relax and I watch drama. Don't get me wrong, but I'm talking about like all that crappy news feed on mm. QAnon and you know Donald Trump and you know even in the coronavirus now and the, the conspiracy theories. Everybody gets sucked into that. But instead yeah. of getting sucked into that, get sucked into your work. You know, I don't know if you know this, but like the average person spends about 13 and a half hours during work week digitally distracted mm -hmm. so that's the stats so when i hear people saying oh i don't have time to do breathing i don't have time to exercise i don't have time it's nonsense just in your work week alone you've 13 and a half hours to spare that you didn't know you had because you didn't realize or you didn't focus on what you're focusing on so if you stop for a moment and actually do what i call it so very quickly a reorientation day is where you stop one day a month. When I say a day, it takes four hours. So I recommend four hours. And you get nothing but a journal and a pen. And you go somewhere uh, really quiet. So either the family, if you have family, need to leave the house, or you just go somewhere. Whether that's a quiet beach or a remote place outdoors, or whether you go to a spa, your favorite spa, and you get your massage, and then you do four hours in the meditation room or wherever it is. But you're just there with your journal, leather-bound journal, I might add. I mean, I, I, most 
blows my mind the amount of people that write down their ideas in really crappy places. If you value your ideas, put them in a valuable place. And that valuable place should be a valuable notepad that you buy wherever you buy it. Moleskine kind of notepad or, or better even than that, whatever you can afford, but like not a scratch pad. Um, and then during that reorientation day, reflect on where you've come from, reflect on where you're going to, reflect on your targets, write everything down, do a full brain dump. Uh, examine all of that information and then plan for the month ahead. And that reorientation day is so key for me, doing four hours of that every month, planning for that four hours, like putting in the schedule, yeah. those four hours, and then turning the bloody phone off. Like that's the most important thing and not looking at the phone. And, and people go, well, what, what, what about an emergency? Well, if I'm down in Monarch Spa or I'm lying on a beach in Wicklow, and I'm like an hour and a half away from my house. When the restrictions open up, we'll yeah. add that in there, right? <laughs> but when I'm down there, I can't get back up quick enough. And if an emergency happens, you're going to have to deal with it on your own, whoever you are, whether that's my wife or my dad or my mom or whatever it is. So that emergency can wait for that length of time. Because if the kids get sick to the extent that they need to be brought to the hospital, I'm an hour and a half away. I can't get up here quick enough. So turn your phone off for four hours. There's nothing that can't wait for four hours. Um, and then that will serve you well. Brilliant, brilliant advice. Absolutely love the, the reorientation day. There's it almost reminded me, I know Bill Gates, and he's the luxury of being able to do this, but he goes away for a week, a year to like a cabin in the woods to, to plot out the whole year ahead. No distractions whatsoever. Just him, some books and, and no paper, no pads. Almost, yeah, I'd, love, almost I'd, a, I'd love to do that, but and I know people do that, but I'll tell you one thing about that. With the level that I, so this is where I'm mindful of that, right? Mm -hmm. So I know people who do those, um, uh, you know, the, the, what do they call it? The, like the quiet meditation retreats. Yeah. The silent retreats, that's the name of it. So the silent re retreats, and sometimes they'll go to a silent retreat for a week um, and they'll meditate for a week and they'll get inside themselves, which I think is probably really fantastic for you, right? Mm -hmm. But here's my problem with it. With the level that I work or the level that I would normally travel, I find that that's very selfish, personally. If you're going like a full week away from my, like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm talking about selfish to my family. Now, if you don't have family, go for it. Knock yourself out, go yeah. for three weeks. Um, <laughs> but I think people need to be mindful of if you're working. So I know people, here's my point. I know people who work like the same level of hours that I do, who already don't spend enough time with their family. Mm -hmm. And then they straight off the back of something, a project that they've been working on, then they go on a silent retreat for a week away from their wife and kids who they haven't potentially seen for two months because they've been absorbed by another project or they've been abroad. Yeah. Um, so I find that inherently very selfish. But if you're, if you're cognizant of the fact that you've already spent enough time with your family and you're okay with going away for people, a lot of people say, oh, it's only a week. Well, for me, you know, I'd rather not do that. I'd rather do a four hour reorientation day. And then down the line, when the kids are maybe 16 or 17, when they don't want to know me, then I'll do the full week or two weeks. Like <laughs> and that, that, that makes so much sense. And, and the four hours as well is going to be achievable. No matter how busy you are, that's going to be achievable for, for everybody as well. So I, and I've, take, I've taken note there. I'm on my sketch pad, I might add, my cheap sketch pad of to buy a, a leather-bound uh, proper journal as well. Yeah. That's one thing. Keith, listen, you've been so generous with your time. I've one more question for you. And I think now, I don't want to, uh, you know, over, overstate this, but I think this is probably the most challenging question you've possibly ever been, ever been posed. Yeah. Um, well. Now, you, all your mentalist skills here, all your powers of prediction, when will Waterford next win the All-Ireland? When will the Dacia win the Lee McCarthy? When they hire me. <laughs> There's there's a there's an opportunity there, a fantastic opportunity for the for water for GAA. So and there's no no other no other no other way around that, is there? No. Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> simple. There it is. Well, we'll we'll have to tag water for GAA in that. Keith, listen, thanks so much for your time. Where where should people go to find out more about you? We'll we we'll link to the YouTube channel. Is it is the website the best place? Yeah, keithbarry.com. I've also got a free ebook that I wrote last year, which I'll be taking down pretty soon, actually. Yeah. So if people want to grab the free ebook, it's called Mind Magic. Just type in keithbarry.com forward slash ebook and completely free. Just, uh, you'll get it sent in your email. Uh, so yeah, keithbarry.com. I'm also on Instagram, Keith Barry there, and then the Keith Barry YouTube channel. Keith, thanks again. A real pleasure. And the very best of luck with all the zany goals. Cheers. Thanks, man. Good luck to you as well. Hello everyone.
Brian here again. A big thank you for listening right to the end of this episode of the Work Well podcast. I want to give a big shout out to our partners, the fruit people who are leading the way in workplace nutrition, both in office and remotely. You can check them out at thefruitpeople.ie. And it's with thanks to the fruit people that we have a delicious fresh fruit and healthy snack pack to give away to one lucky listener for each episode of season three. To find out how to enter, go to workwellpodcast.com and find the link to the latest podcast episode. Finally, are you interested in diving deeper in the area of workplace well-being? Why wouldn't you? You need to check out the Work Well Institute. The Work Well Institute is an online hub for all your workplace well-being, education, and training needs, whether you're an individual or an organization. Head on over to workwellinstitute.org where you'll find out the details on all the courses available, including my flagship program, Developing a Workplace Wellness Program That Lasts. Check it out at workwellinstitute.org. Thanks again for listening. The original music for this podcast was composed by my friend Greg Clifford. Thank you, Greg. Remember to work well, stay safe, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Work Well Podcast.